Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with the favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I'm excited to talk about our guest today, Bronson Hill. Now, if you're not familiar with Bronson, he's the managing member of Bronson Equity, bronsonequity.com. Bronson is a partner in 2,000 multi-family units worth over $200 million, a general partner. He co-leads a large in-person multifamily meetup in Glendale, California, called Investor to Investor, ITI. Bronson's the host of the Mailbox Money Show, and he understands the investor mindset, having spoken individually over the phone with over 1,500 investors and having raised over $40 million for real estate and his ATM machine fund deals. Bronson is the author of the book, Fire Yourself, Replace Your Working Income with Passive Income in Three Years or Less, and is a regular contributor to YouTube and his blog. Bronson leads an exclusive mastermind for affluent passive investors, providing unmatched investment opportunities within a growth-oriented community. Bronson, welcome. Hey, Mark. Really excited to be here, man. Love talking with you. I always learn something. Always, uh, we always have a great conversation. I know I had, had you on my show, the Mailbox Money Show, recently, and that was awesome learning about your land flipping strategy. So I love talking about investing and, and coming up with new ideas that can really help people uh, you know, create more time, really, the time freedom more than just financial freedom, which is great. No, it's it's fantastic, but uh, and I, I love being on your podcast. You you were a great a great host. Uh, I'm probably not going to do as well as you, but I do I do have a <laughs> I don't know about uh, that. <laughs> I do have like the most traditional question, which is, you know, let's rewind the tape. And how did you get started in, you know, multifamily and investing and ATM machines and just the whole idea of, you know, passive income. Yeah. So I, uh, I knew I wanted to be financially free through, uh, you know, and, and really thought through real estate was a way to do it. And so I did kind of what a lot of people do is I started buying houses. And then I realized I had four or five houses and realized it wasn't really that passive. At least the way I had set it up, it wasn't a very passive strategy. And so um, I, uh, you know, there's a saying when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So I had this job where I was making over $200,000 a year in medical device sales. That was my background for 10 years. I worked in surgery with cardiologists and it was very interesting. And I did, you know, 30 hours a week and it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't that hard of work, but I just, they called the golden handcuffs, right? I just couldn't leave. Sure. And what I really wanted to have was really more control over my time. So I could create, so I could write a book, so I could travel, I could do the things I want to do. And so, um, like I said, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So I have a relative that's, uh, that just kind of showed up in my life at one point and was like, Hey, I've been doing this multifamily investing for 25 years and he was uber successful. And I said, wow, that's really amazing. And uh, so he, you know, I said, I don't have the money to do this. And he said, well, you can raise the money. Talk about something called syndication, which is basically raising money from uh, passive investors and helping them to get good cash flow. So started doing that, got into multifamily. And then I, I shifted gears a little bit, especially the last couple of years, interest rates has, have been higher. It's harder to find uh, cash flow in a lot of those deals. So we've shifted to ATM machines, which people do still actually use ATM machines these days. It's hard to believe, but there's a <clears throat> segment of the population that does quite frequently and and some other alternative investments like oil and gas and other things as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting to me when multifamily people get started because I can imagine if you're talking to someone who's just like you and they want to get started in multifamily and, and you just say, oh yeah, raise the money and you have no track record. How do you go out and raise forty, fifty million dollars with investors when you have no track record? Yeah, and, and it's a real challenge, right? And one of the issues is when I started, um, I had sixty-two calls with friends and family, and I counted because uh, I just wanted to know how I was doing. You know, they say every no gets you closer to a yes. Well, I had sixty-two conversations phone calls, in-person meetups, whatever, and absolutely zero invested with me, Mark. So it was like, I felt like yeah. a total failure. Um, the guy who actually invested with me was a guy, mm -hmm. I had started a meetup, this meetup I still run or co-lead um, in, in in California here. And he basically showed up and he was like, hey, I, you know, I'd never seen him before. He's like, hey, I'd invest in one of your deals. And I'm like, are you talking to me? And this is before I had any deals. Yeah. But the interesting thing is when you um, you know, in single family and in smaller stuff, it's typically about your track record and your experience and you're doing all the work. Well, in larger deals, uh, syndication, multifamily, other types of deals, it's not about what you bring. It's about what the team brings. Mm -hmm. So in those deals, often I had partners that were, you know, 10, 20 years of experience in that particular 
asset. And so my lack of experience was not a big issue, but it is a challenge when you go to friends or family or you start hanging a shingle saying, Hey, I'm doing this. And people, you know, at the time they knew me as medical sales Bronson, they didn't know me as real estate or passive investing or fire yourself Bronson. I mean, now of course they know, cause it's, you know, I put it out there, been consistent with that messaging, but um, a lot of people may trust you, your parents, your family, your friends, but they don't trust you in, you know, with your money or their money until you've shown, you know, you can, you can handle it or that you at least have great partners that can handle it. Oh, that's such a good answer for sure. But okay. But even still, when you're building a team, why would they join your team? Um, well, I think the big thing about um, uh, a lot of investing, I've realized it's very much a team sport. I know with what you guys do with, with land flipping as well, uh, you know, you have, you have team members, right? you have people involved, how you source things. You probably got people that help you mail stuff. You have, you know, a team that kind of follows up. So it's all team. So what I realized, um, I wasn't quite sure what my value was that I brought. And again, there's typically kind of two or three main parts when it comes to these larger deals. There's kind of people that raise money, kind of bring the capital side. There's people that um, will find a deal. Those are kind of the, usually the two ways people start. So if I don't have a lot of experience, I can try to start raising money. I can find a deal. And then the more experienced people typically are asset managers or they're the ones kind of operating the day to day. Because in my opinion, there's really no substitute for experience. So I thought initially I'm gonna I'm gonna chase a deal down. I'm gonna be somebody who finds deals. And then um I, I you know I did okay with it. It was fine. But then I realized like I've had 10 years of great, you know, sales experience and working with investors. And why don't I just kind of like, you know, try raising money and see how that goes. So I, I started down that road. And after I found my first investor, it got it got much easier. And so um, but I think the thing is we don't realize if we're a CPA, if we have a business, if we're a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, we have all these skills that we can bring to a deal. We don't just like, hey, we start at nothing. We start with maybe some business experience or some interpersonal experience. And really it takes two things to do a deal, right? It takes the deal and it takes money. So if you can be a part of finding the deal or operating the deal and then the money, if you can just put those together, or be a part of a team that's doing that, um, th there'll definitely be a place for you on a, on a great team. I love it. I love it. All right. So you, you start doing all these deals and and now you're like, okay, I'm going to write a book. Why well, write a book? <laughs> I should ask you the same question, right? Why write a book? Uh, well, I think, you know, a lot of times when you write a book, um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. There's a few things. I, I, I had wanted to write a book for a while. I never really committed to it. And Tony Robbins, I'm a big personal development guy. He has this quote and he says, it's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So in, in a lot of different ways. So um, I actually made the decision while I was at a Tony Robbins event, you know, ironically, or I guess not so ironically. Um, and that was, um, you know, I made the decision and I said, I'm, I'm going to write this book. And then I kind of started researching how to write a book. And really it's, it's not hard to write a book. You know, there's a, a motivational speaker, his name is Jim Rohn. He passed away, but he would say something is defined is easy means you can do it. And if it's hard, it means you can't do it. So anybody can write a book, right? It's not like, unless you just physically can't type or can't talk or whatever, like it's, it's people can do it. So what I realized is if I took 60 minutes on the timer and I did that five days a week, just during, I just scheduled it just like another meeting. I just schedule it. I just get in that mode, whatever. And if it was, um, you know, a lot of times 60 minutes was enough to get about a thousand words or 1200 words. Uh, if it was less, sometimes if I was doing a little research, but generally then, you know, I was able to write. And then after about two months, I had about 32,000 words. I think my book ended up being about 45,000 words. So I added a little more later, but a lot of times it's just, it's just getting in the habit of writing. And so, um, I actually would love to know, Mark, how did, you know, what made you want to write your book? Or how did well, you I think, book? you know, my book was really more a, as, as like a cautionary tale okay. about my story, as well as a general overview of the land investing space. And then, you know, then I th just think it's like, okay, this is a great way for people to get introduced into land investing. And then for me, as the person who wrote the book, well, then it's instant credibility because even though it's easy to write a book, it's not easy to write a book. Yeah, not everybody writes Otherwise, a book. We'd, we'd all write a book. So um, that that's why I wrote Dirt Rich. And and now Dirt Rich 2 is sort of the next step of that as far as how to scale a land business. And uh, I'm very excited about you know, publishing that, but it's it's all done. It's just in, in, okay. in layout mode and working on the audio book right now. Nice. But, uh, you know, but it's so interesting because like, I think we're both like these personal development guys and and it's not just, uh, hey, can we make as much money as possible as fast as possible? It's it's a, a deeper level than that. And uh, you tease that out of me in, in your podcast. I'd like to tease that out of you yeah. in this podcast. And I, and I think the way to do that would just be starting with a more general question. What's your definition of success? 
Yeah. So I realized I didn't really answer uh, your question about, you know, why did I write the book? Um, you know, really, you know, like the subtitle says, replace your working income with passive income in three years or less. Um, you know, for me, I just, I've realized having all these calls with investors, um, they, a lot of people just don't know how to get started. You know, they're, they're doing stocks and bonds. They've got a money person. I had a call yesterday with a physician. This is not an uncommon call. Uh, you know, net worth of around 5 million, only done stocks and bonds. And it's just, you know, very limited. And he's like, well, how, you know, if I quit my business or my, you know, like he has a business and he kind of sold it recently. And he's like, well, how do I, how do I generate cash if I don't work? And that's a real issue for people. So that's the idea yeah. of how do you generate more, uh, really about generating more time, but how you do that is by covering expenses so that work is optional and you can kind of work how you want to work. So that's really why I created it. And it's just a, you know, a guide to passive investing in alternative assets. So that's why I did it. But, um, you know, you, I guess your question, your other question was really, um, you know, why, I, why, why do this, right? Why, you know, help people in this way? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, not necessarily that, but just, yeah. I mean, that's probably a better question. Like why, why help people yeah. do this? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it comes down to, um, what we're here to do once you discover your purpose, right? So what, if I'm financially free, um, you know, it's, it said that like something like 65 or 70, 70% of people, they don't like their jobs. They're not engaged at work. And so I think that's just really sad. I mean, we go to work because we have to go to work. And I was there, you know, I did it and I was, I was good at it and I could do it and it was fine, but I just, it wasn't challenging. I wasn't growing. I wasn't, there wasn't the never ending learning and kind of that unique ability that, you know, we've talked about a little bit where it's like, what, what are you doing that when you do it, you just come alive. And so for me, I just, I really want, I feel like when people become financially free, it allows them to be able to go write that book, to be able to go travel. Last time I, last year I traveled six times internationally, right? To be able to create memories of my daughter, to be able to have time to invest in different things that are meaningful. And so I find that, you know, it's, I find that cause really worthwhile. I also find the bigger kind of below all of it is my, my goal is to help the cause of ending modern day human slavery in the world, which is people don't realize there's actually 20 to 40 million human slaves today, more than there's ever been in the history of the world. And it just keeps getting worse. And so this is a problem that I'm very passionate about. And this allows me to have time and effort to focus and resources to focus on that. So those are things that are kind of the reasons why I focused on on this. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right, just, just for fun, complete this question. The most important thing in life is? Oh, the most important thing in life is relationship, relationship with God, relationship with people. Um, it's, you know, doing life with people. And I think a part of relationship is loving them and letting them love you and, you know, just not being by yourself doing it. It's really that we have the gift of community and family and friends and I think spirituality and all these things that really help us to, um, you know, just because if you only look at life, that it's just dollars and cents and what you see. And it's just life is so it's, it can be very negative. It just can be as you said, like an, like an 85% or 90% negative bias. Just when we see, we're just, and we know a lot of people like this that are always being negative. And so when yeah, people I mean, are we're kind of wired for it, we're, we're wired for survival. We have this negative bias. I mean, this is why these, the news shows always, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. It's just yeah. the way we're wired. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, in general, just really uh, finding a way to, to live out my purpose and to help other people live out their purpose. Um, I, I think there's nothing more fulfilling. Um, I think there's nothing more. And I think, I think that's pretty universal. Like if somebody is just really wrestling with um, depression or other things, if you, if you just get a hold of, you know, try to get a hold of what you're here to do, I think we're all created for a purpose. And I think if you can just do that, um, you'll, you'll, you'll have a much better life and the people around you will be much happier that you're happy. <laughs> no, yeah, no, a hundred percent. It ripples out. And I think, you know, what you're doing with your passive income or helping people create that passive income, it's giving them that time. It's giving them the resources. It's in allowing them, they have the energy, right? In the peak of their life. So it's giving them that yeah. trifecta to really have the space to explore their deeper purpose yeah. and also to improve their relationships. And so we're, we're very aligned that way that, it's the the goal isn't to go and you know sip pina coladas and you know play golf every day with with your your passive income exceeding your fixed expenses. I think we'd be bored, mm -hmm. but I think having that purpose and improving other people's lives is is way more meaningful. But it's really hard to do. To your point, if you've got a W two job, you're exhausted by the end of it, and you just don't have the bandwidth to to do it so what's your advice to that guy sitting in the cubicle right now or gal and procter and gamble and how do they get out of it how do they fire themselves 
Yeah, actually, I know a couple that actually worked at Procter and Gamble, and and they were doing well there, and they actually fired themselves and found a way out as well. So, which is kind of neat. But but yeah, I mean, I think I remember the 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 years. I think I had six years of going to real estate meetups and not really doing anything because I didn't make the decision right. And I think everything started to change for me when I made the decision. And that's you know the Tony Robbins. You're in moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So if you make a decision, that, hey. I don't know how this is going to happen, but I'm going to do this. And it was, I'm going to leave my job in three years. And it, and I did, it was less than three years. I was able to leave my job. And so, um, you know, I didn't know how, and sometimes that'll happen where, you know, we don't always know how we're going to get uh, to a goal, but if we create a goal or we say, Hey, I want this. Um, I'm also a big fan of personality tests. Um, there's something called strengths finder, which kind of looks at some of that unique ability stuff. What do you, when you do it, you feel strong, you feel like you come alive, you could do it all day. And the more we're cast and we're doing things that were, you know, it's not like necessarily like you're an introvert, extrovert, but it's more like one of mine's uh, futuristic. So planning for the future or learner or something where I'm learning. Those are things that like, if you're operating from a place of strength, um, there is an energizing effect. And so I think that's that's a really big thing. And I think, um, I'm going to butcher this quote, but there's kind of the idea of like, don't ask what the world needs, you know, or something, but uh, ask what makes you come alive and then do that. And the world needs more people that have come alive. And I think that it's really true. And so I'd rather, um, you know, spend time and less money and things to do things that are developing passions of mine than to do a job. I mean, I could literally go back and go get a job and make 200K a year and go do it. It would be fine. I'd work, whatever, but it just, it, it wouldn't be challenging for me. It wouldn't be something that would really give me that energy. Right. And so I think for, for individuals, it's important to like go through the week and make an assessment of what are the things that you do during a normal work week or your, your home, whatever, that make you feel like you come alive. And if you can find a way to do more of those things, um, you'll live a happier life and everybody around you will live a better, they'll, they'll be enriched by that as well. Yeah, I, I, we're so aligned on this. I so agree, but let's just play de devil's advocate. I'm in the car right now. I'm listening to you say this and I'm kind of rolling my eyes because I'm like, okay, well, Bronson, easy for you to say, I'm working 60 hours a week. I got three kids. And it's just not so easy for me to just go ahead and fire myself and you see what, you know, and have that luxury of finding out what makes me come alive. And then it's a big risk too. Like, what if I start going into, you know, the syndication world or I go in the land world or the ATM world and, and I've got all these dependents and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now it's, it's like, you know, the, the fear, I can feel the fear sometimes with people yeah. to, to make that leap. How do you, how do you reconcile that? I mean, I mean, we, you and I did it. Yeah. And so it's, how do you, yeah. You yeah, know, like, so yeah, you can do it too, but like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I was afraid I had a great investment banking job. I was afraid to quit. Yeah. You know, great medical sales job. I mean, I'm sure you were afraid when you, when you took that. Yeah. Leap, but... Yeah. I'm still afraid sometimes, you know, those things yeah. happen. I still have setbacks. I still have failures. I still have things that don't go as well as I like and, or things that are, you know, really challenging. And so, um, I think, you know, life is going to be full of challenges and I think everybody's situation is different. So, and not everybody's wired to be an entrepreneur. It's not everybody can do that. Um, you know, what we, the book is actually a little more about, uh, it's more about passive investing. Less, you know, my story, it's more about how does somebody get started? So the person who's working 60 hours a week, um, you know, instead of just only having active income where you're working in your business, you're working at your job, you know, you have all the things you do, you start taking some of your, uh, you know, your, your money, your resources, and you put it towards passive investing and you learn. So you put 50 or 100,000 in a deal with someone and you start investing. And then it's like a muscle that as it grows and you see, okay, there's cash flow, this is how it works, then it gives you the ability to start um, replacing income. So I, I came to the, the belief that I think, you know, $5,000 of passive income increasing per year is more powerful than like $50,000 of active income because it, it just basically over time, it will scale up. It takes time to get there, but it's a skill. And it's like, it's like something you learn and you train yourself to do. So it's not even that the investments go well or not. Obviously you hope every investment goes well, you never have a loss, but it's really about the learning. It's about the learning that happens. And when I see the, the light bulb go on where somebody's invested in a couple of deals or something, they're like, oh my gosh, this stuff actually works. I actually know how I could leave my practice as a physician or I could sell my business and I could still have income coming in. And this is kind of, you know, I worked with a couple of physicians that worked uh, 60 to 80 hours a week and they were making several million dollars a year each, but they didn't have time freedom. And so the idea of being able to take some of the resources now for them, it wouldn't be that hard. You just take some of that money each year and you start putting it in deals. And after a little while, you realize, well, what are your living expenses? Once you cover, it's not necessarily your income, but you cover your living expenses. 
um, in my opinion, you're free, right? You've really done that rat race number. You've been able to replace that. And so I think for people, it, it may be that some people are, are, are people that have more money than time and some people have more time than money. If you have more time than money, you do what I did and you do it yourself. If you have more money than you have time, you learn and you develop the skill uh, to be able to passively invest. And that's really the, uh, the appeal of fire yourself. I love it. I love it. And if I'm evaluating different multifamily operators, what's the best piece of advice you would give if I'm looking at A, B, and C as an option? What would you say? Here's some. Here's a. Here's a question or two you should ask. Yeah. Well, there's a. I have kind of a three step, three part system, and I'll try to share this briefly. It's in the book. But at the top people a lot of times will start with a deal, and they'll say, "Oh, is the deal a great deal?" And, and you know, once you start getting in the deal flow, you start getting, you know, you go to meetups and conferences. People start sending you deals. You get on people's deal list. We have a, a deal list. People can get on as well. But uh, typically, when you a deal comes to you, you have to kind of stop and go back and say, "What is the market here? Like, what is whether it's you know Atlanta, Georgia, or it's uh, Cleveland, Ohio? Is the population growing? Is the is the job growth there? Is income growing?" Growing? Is it a landlord and business friendly area? Are these the things? So whatever market is, it also exists in any type of deal. The market, so the ATM machine market, is that a growing market or a shrinking market? Well, surprisingly, it's actually grown about 4.1% per year of people of the number of transactions. Surprising, but it's it's true and it's been confirmed. So you look at the market of whatever the deal is, then you go next step is the operator. Who is the team? Is this similar to what they've done before? Is it is there someone on the team that has you know, 10, 15 years of experience doing this? And you can say, is this kind of a rinse and repeat? They've done it before type of deal. Are the values aligned? Line, those type of things. A lot of a great question you can ask is, um, tell me about a deal that didn't go well, or tell me about something that didn't go as planned. And if they don't have anything to share, either they're not being forthright or they just don't have any experience. And so you want to kind of be aware of that. And then the last thing you come back to the deal. And so after you looked at the market, the operator, and you look down at the deal, you say, okay, well, does this deal make sense? Do I understand how I'm going to make money in this? And do I understand also how I could lose money? And so that's even a better question, right? Just And, and, and does that meet your parameters? Are you trying to reduce taxes? Are you trying to get cash flow? Are you trying to get appreciation? And so I think, you know, whether it's multifamily or any other asset, those are three things I think everybody should kind of walk in those in, the, in that order. Oh, fantastic. Well, Bronson, your your mentorship has been invaluable. <laughs> and I could talk to you uh, all day. We'll have to do a part two and go a little bit That's deeper fine, man. Thank uh, you. into uh, you know personal development. But now we're at that point in the podcast where I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the auto passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Um, well, I just read this book this week and it was really good. It's this, it's this book called Bit Bigger, Better, Bolder by Jennifer Cohen. And it just talks about this idea of being bold, like being like we miss all the shots we don't take. Um, if we don't ask, we don't have. And so just being willing to ask for bigger and better things in your life from people you know, in your personal life, in relationships, all these things, they're great books. I recommend that book. And uh, I really got encouraged by that. Bigger, Better, Bolder. I have not heard of that book. I, I'm yeah. definitely going to get that book uh, yeah. today. So, is it on, audio, uh, on Audible? I think it's yeah, it's Audible. It's it's uh yeah it's it's a it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. I got to meet the author. It was really nice, and uh, yeah, just some great stories in there for sure. All right, fantastic. Well, before we go to my tip of the week, just to remind everybody, today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn how the next sixteen weeks can change your life because you're going to go up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, and efficiently with our team. And I know what you're thinking, oh. What about the tuition? And it's going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed. You're going to make back that money 180 days or less. Just show us you did the work. Learn more. Go to landgeek.com forward slash training. The landgeek.com forward slash training. Start doing land deals and not have to deal with any renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents. All right. My tip of the week is just get smarter and go to bronsonequity.com. Get the book, Fire Yourself. And, you know, Obviously, you've heard Bronson now. Uh, he's going to be the kind of guy you, you want to work with. So check it out, bronsonequity.com. Bronson, are we good? Yeah, man. Thanks so much for having me. I love talking with you. I always learn something. I always love your attitude and the uh, just the you know fun way you make learning exciting and what you're doing with your business, too. It's really exciting. I got to learn more about land flipping. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Well, I want to thank the listeners and remind you that the only way, the only way Bronson's going to come back for a part two is if you do two, three little favors, follow, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com, and I'm going to send you for free a signed book of Dirt Rich. Even if you don't want the book, just do it anyway. It helps us because guys like Bronson look at our reviews, and if there's no reviews, he's like, ah, 
forget it. I'll go on a different podcast. So do it selfishly for yourselves. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Let freedom ring. Thanks, Bronson. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.